Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Adrian Danila. This is Multifamily Chronicles. Our guest today is Jindo Lee. Welcome to the show, Jindo. Hello, Adrian. How are you? Jindo is the founder and the CEO of HappyCo. Jindo, to begin this episode with, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Walk us through your journey a little bit. Yeah, so... Um... My, I sort of grew up in Australia, so uh, you know, I don't have the typical uh, surfing look, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but I grew up in Australia. My my parents were uh, immigrants from Singapore. Um, you know, my 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 dad essentially works a lot of. He was a printer by by trade, so you know, very blue collar family. Um, and that will probably hopefully come back into the story later on. Uh, but we didn't grow up with a ton of money, you know, I think we were kind of in, in this early years or sort of below middle class and then eventually moved their way up to middle class. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I studied graphic design at university. So I, you know, I actually grew up in a place called Darwin. So Darwin is, uh, if you think of Fernal Dundee, that's basically Darwin. And then um, for my college years or university years, I moved to Adelaide for, for college and studied graphic design. Um, you know, I didn't really have, uh, I didn't even know what I really wanted to do to be, to be quite frank. I, the only one, one regret I have is I wish I was a soccer, like a professional soccer player, um, which I didn't, I didn't make. I only got to like the semi-professional level, got paid just enough to you know, buy a few beers <laughs> at the pub. Um, but, but really I studied graphic design, um, because I was, I had an interest in computers. I love, you know, building things, creating things, and then. Uh, I was using Photoshop in, uh, you know, just the, the years before college. And I'm like, oh, this is really fun. And someone said, oh, you know, you can create a career out of this. And I'm like, what, using Photoshop to make things? And they're like, yeah. And uh, so that that began the sort of, um, yeah, me being interested in graphic design as a, as a I guess, something to study. <laughs> yeah, so that that's kind of that, that back early background. So walk us through the next thing after... You know this this experience. You know your your college years, and you you discover graphic design. Yeah. What was next for you? So after the so during design school, um, a lot of my peers were doing logo and branding and all the you know like making brochures and all that kind of stuff. But I really really liked uh, the digital side. You know, like this is two thousand and nineteen ninety eight to early two thousand like that time frame. And then I was like, wow, there's this thing called the internet. It's super fun. Um, I really just wanted to use computers to make things. And so uh, I, I really focused a lot on building websites, building um, software applications, designing it. And then when I graduated, I worked for a, um, a few web design agencies. And then I actually ended up working in a video gaming company. So the, the video gaming company was called Midway Games. And uh, um, if you remember Mortal Kombat, uh, I actually got to work on games like Mortal Kombat, uh, uh, Dukes of Hazard, Gauntlet Legends. And I was in charge of the user interface team to, to build the user interface for these video games. So that, yeah, so that's like kind of like the second chapter of my, my life is making video games. Um, and then I, I got um, probably a couple of years in and, and I was like, man, you know, like, when you realize how the sausage is made, you realize, oh, I don't really want to eat the sausage anymore, which is basically like video games just made me more stressed because I would, when I'm playing a game, I would look at how they built the, how they built the game. And so I um, decided to kind of finish up my career there. I moved back to Australia and I started my own um, uh, web agency. So I started building websites and technology, like software applications for for businesses uh, did that for about five, five years, six years. Um, I sold the company, and then what I did then, you know, I had a, a bunch of various other. Oh, man, if if I uh, wrote a book, I could write a book on all my failures. I started, you know, 10, 11, 12 different ideas or businesses or concepts. Um, but then after that, I took a bit of a break, and my 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 dad said to me, "Hey, you should go buy real estate. You know, invest in some real estate. You know, get off your ass and go do be useful." Um, so I started doing that. I started investing in, in properties in, in Australia. And then in 2010, 11, I started investing in properties in um, Cleveland and Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, so that really kicked off my investing journey. And I actually was really excited to invest in, in, in property because um, 
I remember my first property, I, I bought it and I all I did was just put a, a coat of paint, cleaned up the property. And then the tenants that that moved in at the time, they were so grateful. They're like, oh my God, you know, they were a young family. They were just, I think they just had their first kid. And to me, it was like building a, a space for someone to live in. And, and you know, that was like, it felt really gratifying, satisfying as well. So um, that was sort of my my journey into um, an, an investor. So as an investor, how large of a portfolio did you end up with? Yeah, so initially I was doing all single family. Uh, so in Australia, uh, we don't have multifamily in Australia, which is a big surprise. Um, you know, we I probably got to about uh, about ten to twelve properties at that stage. Uh, you know, single family, and um, when I started investing in the US, um, it was you know financial crisis time. So you, I was able to buy properties at 20, 30% net like cash flow. And yeah, that was like super crazy. In Australia, you wouldn't get any positive cash flow properties, they're all negative cash flow. So so that was a like a big moment. I really wanted to transition as much as I could from Australia to the US. Um, and then what actually happened during that process was I had my properties were being managed by um, these third party property managers. And I remember a few of them had these. Uh, the tenants were that caused some damage and I said oh yeah we can just you know um, get the, the deposits back to fix the property and the, the manager's like well we didn't actually document this <laughs> and like what do you mean well we kind of took some photos but we put it in this like I don't know g drive that the g drive went missing or blah 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 and then this happened to two or three of the properties at the same time and I'm like what is going what what is wrong with these people they they manage my properties and I pay them so much money you know at least I thought I paid a lot of money and I realized that um I followed them around and I saw that they were using um you know like old software systems you know like they were I think they were using propertyware yardy at the time I think one of them were using buildium or something and I'm just like Oh my god! This is how you manage the properties. This is no wonder you can't do it. There's no no way for you to collect photos or do anything, and and so that kicked off the idea, which is like, hmm, maybe I can build an app on an iPad to do inspections. And so, I spent more time with the the managers, and I said, what if I build an app? What do you think? They're like, oh, that'll be really cool. Yeah, yeah. And they, I didn't, they didn't think anything of it. Um, so then I uh, designed uh, on some like an iPad one. I designed some screenshots of an inspection app. Right. So it's just a very basic app to do, to take photos, to make notes, to make ratings of the um, of, of the property. Um, from that, I I rang 20 companies, random companies. I said, hey, i got an idea for an inspection app. Can I come and show it to you? Um, and they, surprisingly, they all said, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so I visited 20 companies, showed them the, the screenshots, and 19 of the 20 people actually purchased the software from us which at that stage we had no software it was just screenshots uh so that really kicked off the journey of to, to start you know uh, basically like happy code <laughs> so that that's how we got started humble beginnings but also very you know very uh how would i say very efficient if you if you close 19 out of 20 that's yeah. uh that that's an impressive closing rate that's 95 percent yeah it it, it, it it's um you know, like uh, back then, um, running a startup, like there wasn't a lot of information. This is 2011, right? So, and I had no idea what I was doing, but I just felt like, oh, huh, this is uh, this is too easy. And, and everyone was giving me like 50 bucks a month. So, so when you had like maybe, what is it? Like a thousand, less than a thousand dollars, right? And I'm like, huh, maybe if I just, you know, found more of these kind of uh, customers, I could have enough so that I can actually like just do this full time. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. We, my, my co-founder, my business partner and, and co-founder of Happy Co, he's the en software engineer. He's the smart guy. He's the guy that can code. Um, and he was working for me, my last company that I, that I started. Uh, so I said, Hey, do you want to build this, you know, together? He said, yeah, sure. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we had no idea what we were doing or getting ourselves into, but, uh, I think it worked out. It worked out pretty well now. <laughs> so you have founded and exited two tech companies before Happy Co. Is that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. So you're a serial entrepreneur. It's safe to say that. Uh, I, I think I'm a serial failure of things and a few things have actually happened to work out well <laughs> or work out. Um, yeah. 
I, I want to talk about uh, failure. It, it's extremely yeah. important, and I'm so glad that you're mentioning most people uh, don't open up to failure, mm. right? Yeah. And I think this makes most in society to look up, you know, someone like you and say, wow, you know, he has this, you know, he's successful. They yeah. don't, they're thinking that the trajectory is like a, you know, rocket trajectory, straight yeah. out when everything is like up and down and up and down and up and down. So what have you learned most? T tell me about the most powerful lessons that you learned from failure. Oh man, there's so many, so many, like so many lessons, right? Even, even today, you know, people will say, oh, you run a successful company. I feel like I'm failing every single day. But I think the, 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 maybe the one thing um, that I can maybe share is uh, like, I look at failure as like an opportunity, right? So you, you kind of look at it and you go, okay, what, what happened? Like if you, if you can, um, this sounds really weird, but if you can kind of step outside your own body, Right. Imagine you're not yourself and you're just looking at someone that looks like you going, oh, I failed and like in the corner of the room. Imagine if you're like someone just saying, hey, why did you fail? And then that person's going, you know what I, why I failed was because um, uh, I decided to go build the product without even talking to a customer. <laughs> you know, the, What's the lesson did you learn there? Uh, the lesson is go and talk to customers. Okay. And so I, I feel like the, the, this constant... Um, feeling of failure is an, a constant opportunity to, to just keep improving and, and try not to do the same thing. But I think as humans, we always try to, we actually get back into our old patterns and we get back to this, you know, the, the, so it's really hard. You kind of have to slap yourself a few times to break yourself out of these, uh, these loops, so to speak. Yeah. For someone that wants to become an entrepreneur, what are some the best top three pieces of advice that you have, or you, you, you could, you, you could give as many as you, as you like yeah um i think like uh, for me like you know really asking yourself like what you want out of life personally like what what is it do you really want out of life you know and and, and being very clear about like is it money is it fame fortune is it time um do you have something to prove like whatever it is i think understanding yourself is is very very important um the other thing is like uh, fear like there's you know there's a saying there's nothing to fear but fear itself like fear is just a feeling it's not real it's how we think about things um you know i, I kind of had to learn at a young age playing sport growing up that it, it, you can control how you feel <laughs> you know you, that's the only thing you kind of control you can't control what people tell you you can't control the external environment but once something comes into your uh system or body you you have the choice i mean sometimes it's a choice sometimes it's not but you off, more than often have the choice to 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 how to interpret that 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 incident or the um the experience and so i think that's a really important thing as an entrepreneur and then i think the last thing is just like you know if you really want to go do something um just go do it like how hard can it you know i always uh, i had this uh, friend who started one of my first companies with um he always used to say uh how hard can it be you know, that, that was just his saying. And I'm like, oh, yeah, how hard can it be? It can't be that hard. Like, Because if you meet, um, like even if you met me in person or other successful people, you realize they're just human. They're just, you know, we have the same flaws. We have the same, you know, like we're, we're all trying to figure something out. And so I feel like the um, people often are so worried and afraid of failure. Um, you know, but I, I just say, just go for it and try it. And then the worst case is you can always go back and get a job again. <laughs> so it's not that bad. Jindo, if you were to look back at your young self when you were like yeah. 18, 20 years old, knowing what you know today, what what are some great pieces of advice you would give your young self? Wow, that, that that's a good one. Um, I, I, if I if I if I knew myself back then, I would tell myself to go invest in multifamilies. <laughs> Seriously, like it, the the amount of um, I, I think it's a very rewarding thing right because you can you can generate a lot of wealth for yourself um you can generate a lot of you can generate wealth for the long gen like for many generations down the track as well right and and i think if you're a very good operator with the right motivations you can create a, a community or an asset where people actually want to live in and actually has a good life and it's not just about you know money making money making money it's i think it's about like you know if i met some of these um 
uh, some of our customers who own 10, 20, 30,000 units. I, I recently was with uh, Widener Communities, and Dean Widener. He, you know, he, he owns 70,000 units. <laughs> like, holy, holy cow, that's a lot of units. And then just, you know, being able to affect change. A lot of these people are very, have really big hearts. They, they, they contribute back to society. They do a lot of like charity work. And to me, I'm like, if I could tell my myself, like, hey, start a multifamily um, and learn, learn all, try to learn as much as you can about money and finance, finances. Um, we, we don't, I didn't get taught anything about money growing up. My, my mom and dad weren't that super educated. So um, I didn't get taught anything about money. <laughs> like no one told me to save money. No one told me to invest money. It, it, things I had to learn along the way. So if I could teach my early self is like get educated about it, learn about it, and then talk to people who are doing really well and, and you know, get investing tips, financial tips from, from those people. Because um, actually the, the, on the other side of that story is I remember early in my career and my life, um, you talk to like people that are close to you and you try to get finance, finance tips from your friends, right? But your friends are poor. <laughs> and so, so the, your, your poor friends uh, give you finance tips or, or information that is relevant to their perspective of the world. Um, and I remember one guy, he's like, oh, don't invest in property. I'm like, why? Oh, because if, you know, then you're in debt. You owe your money and this. And, and, and then he, he, <laughs> he wasn't doing very well. And, you know, for a while, I actually listened to him. And then I realized, wait, why? You know, if I wanted to play, be a good soccer player, I'll go find a good coach. I go play with better players. I don't go to the, the coach that has never played soccer before. So I think that's a really important thing I learned is like, try to talk to people that have done what you want to do. So it helps you to, um, you can kind of see the path forward as well. Yeah. Hopefully that helps. I don't know if that, if that made sense. One of my favorite principles were, you know, pieces of advice is, don't take advice from anyone that hasn't been where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah you, totally agree on that one. Yeah, you, you say you're saying the same thing pretty much using yeah. different words. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you you took us to the beginning of Happy Call. Walk us through <laughs> the journey, right? How we understand? I understand the the app was very basic, you know, uh, and addressed you know some basic needs of multifamily. How did it evolve? and walk us through what it is today and what type of yeah. capabilities it has. Yeah, so like the initial years, the app was actually built for single family property managers. That, that's how we started, right? And then um, 2016 was our big break. So we started in 2011, 2012, and we just kept building this inspection app, trying to improve it. People was like, hey, can I have customized ratings? Okay, sure, we'll do customized ratings. Um, you know, one thing that we've always had is like simplicity. We made the app very easy to use. Um, again, this was, you know, like growing up with my dad, I know he was like technology challenged, right? And so his technology channel, I understand his persona. Um, and maintenance is a big uh, user of our software maintenance technicians. And, you know, being an immigrant son, um, I, I know how how hard it is for, for non-technology savvy, non-English speakers to use any kind of technology. So trying to make sure that the, that app was so simple to use. And one example, again, through failure, we make it better. Right? So the failure was um, I followed one of our very early customers around, and this is a maintenance guy. And I was looking at him use the inspection app, and he's trying to press the iPad. He's, I don't know what he's doing. And I looked over his shoulder, and I realized that his fingers were the size of sausages. He's a Polish guy, massive fingers. And so he's basically, you know, like he's cussing you in Polish, and he's like, this app is so hard. I can't press the button. It needs to be bigger. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's it. <laughs> so we made the app bigger. Everything was bigger. Um, which, you know, so, so those are the things when you do through failure, you kind of like, what's the opportunity to improve? And so we, we've taken that philosophy, trying to build and build and build. Um, the long story short, we went from an inspection app in single family to 2016. We sold into multifamily. Our first customer had 110,000 units. That was equity residential. And um, we thought, hmm, we, we, maybe we focus on multifamily. So we continue to grow in that space. Uh, uh, today, we have about three and a half million units that use our, our software. And we've, in, we've gone from inspections to now we have um, a full work order maintenance platform that does unit turns, preventive maintenance, uh, ongoing in, in, inspections and work orders. Uh, we have a due diligence product 
when someone is trying to buy an asset to do unit walks, lease file orders, we have a product for that. We have a CapEx and renovation asset management tool. So now you own the the the, the asset. How do you manage the renovations? Uh, how do you like, you know, one of the common problems is as the owner, they go, how many units have been upgraded? Of the 200 units, how many? They're like, oh, I don't know. Let me call the, the, the manager. The manager says, how, how many of them have you upgraded? And I just like, uh, I think a hundred maybe. And then they have to call the technician, which how many of the upgraded? Oh, uh, 85. And then it's all wrong because um, in the eyes of the owner, what upgrade means is very different from what's actually in the property. So that product is helping to manage the communication and the, the project management of, of um, CapEx and renovation. Um, we also acquired a company last year called Yuhu. Uh, so from that, we actually have a resident portal as well as a uh, leasing and CRM product that, that um, that's being used as well. Um, and then finally, we have this thing called Happy Force, which is a uh, essentially a, a virtual maintenance product. So um, the whole idea with that product is we we actually have technicians that work for Happy Force, and they are solving work order tickets virtually on their phone or like yeah virtually before anyone has to go into the the properties so we have a we have a bunch of stuff <laughs> so it's it's continued to grow yeah that's exciting it's got to be exciting yes so you're happy force technicians they're doing triage is that right sorry they do, yeah they're, they're doing triage and yeah. try to resolve like via messages or maybe phone calls i'm imagining right because i Correct. never use your technology yeah. um that's 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 a very interesting concept you know um you could solve how how many percentage wise when you use happy call uh, happy force percentage wise of the work orders how many of the work orders you could save using your happy force team yeah so there's a few like interesting things right so happy force um to, so it's evolved a lot so we, again we pushed out about 18 months ago it failed. Some of when I was my film, it keep evolving, evolving, evolving. Um, today, Happy Force is a 24-7, 365 day solution. So initially it was just nine to five. Then we then our customers like, uh, can you help us after hours? So um, so we do 24-7, 365. The some of the results are about 15 to 20% of work order tickets can be virtually triaged or resolved. And these are simple things like um, garbage disposal reset. Um, uh, what else? Like uh, yeah, the, the the tap is not is like leaking a little bit, but not a flood. So how do you like tighten the screw or do do this and that? And sometimes the residents are some, most of them are happy to to, to self fix their own problems, which is again, you know, people. When I first started this this project, the customers like, oh, people won't people pay us good money. They don't want to touch anything. And there is a small percentage of people that don't like residents. They don't want to touch anything, but most often than not, if you tell someone, do you want me, do you want to solve it right now, or do you want me to put in a request and then wait forty eight hours for someone to fix it? Everyone's like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it with you right now. Um, and it class A, B, C it doesn't really matter. It's not really like uh, asset class dependent as well. So uh, about twenty percent of them can be solved. That's that's a significant number. Yeah. Um and then the, the other really cool part is um there's probably two other really interesting things like the uh after hour emergency calls two out of five of them are not true emergency calls all right like they're, they're basically someone saying oh there's a flood but what they really mean is like a little trickle of water <laughs> in the plumbing uh so we can help save time you know people like the technician has to wake up now they can kind of sleep until there's a real emergency then then our team will alert them to come out um, and then the other one is the resident. Um, the, the average response time for a resident is about well, like 48 hours before the resident puts in a ticket and it gets a resolution or some communication. We communicate to the resident within three to seven minutes on average, which, which means that there's less work order tickets because they don't put in a second work order ticket. Um, but what it really means is the, the satisfaction from the resident is like, oh my God, someone actually got back to me so quickly. That's amazing. So that's a... Um, yeah, some of the additional benefits that we're seeing. So I'm trying to understand even better how Happy yeah. Force works. When a resident texts or calls, are mm -hmm. they the first point of contact always triaging, like reading the work orders before it gets to the team or how, how does it work? 
Yeah, so the, the the work order is either put in through a work order system, maybe through a resident portal or uh, via like a, you know, calling calling the, the front office. We actually have a uh, IVR, like a call center solution, automatic call center solution. If someone is calling in, they will say, hey, press one for maintenance. So you press one. And if it's an emergency, press one. If not, tell me your issue. We actually translate all of the um, speech into text as well. And so now it automatically creates a work order. So that's how you we get the work orders in. Uh, once the work orders are in place, uh, our technicians essentially think of like um, centralization on steroids. So our, our technicians look at all work orders across every single system in this one database. All right, and then we can go to centralization later on. But uh, the, so now they see everything in one database and they can kind of sort through the different category, the urgency, the time, and essentially, um, each technician is also assigned to a, uh, a bunch of customers so, or, or uh, assets or, or properties. And they're just looking through and saying, okay, I can do this one, I can do this one. So they start semi-automatically reaching out to the resident via text message or email. Um, and then they're triaging things that, okay, this one looks easy. So they're getting rid of all the easy ones. Then the hard ones, sometimes they get on a call the resident, what is on the easy ticket is actually not easy. So they have to go, okay, so what did you do? Oh, I tried, you know, putting this thing and that thing. Okay. Okay. sounds like your block drain, you need a snake. Uh, do you want me to send you a snake or do you want me to just put a ticket in for the technician? Uh, this is, I think, I don't have the numbers on this one, but some people were happy to for us to send them a snake to do their own cleaning, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, some people are like, oh, I'll just get the technician to come. And so we would tell the technician, bring a snake when you come into this uh, this unit. So that's how we, we, we solve it today. So Happy Force, how large of a Happy Force do you have? How many people work currently? In a happy yeah, so we have uh, about um, uh, between 20 to 30 maintenance guys that work on that today, um, roughly servicing about 100,000 units right now. And do you have a number of how between, let's say, these 20, 30 individuals, how many yeah. is they're solving a day in average? Oh, man. Um, I think each individual is probably solving between one to 200 tickets a day. Um, one which is the yeah, so they're like smashing through tickets, right? And and because if you think about tickets, um, a lot of them are like old tickets that don't need re resolution anymore, <laughs> like it's in the system, no one cleared it out, or some tickets are duplicate system, uh, duplicate tickets, right? So, so what we're really doing for the on site team, the benefit we're giving them is instead of having a thousand work order tickets overnight, they're getting maybe a, a two thirds of that, so they're maybe getting 600 of them. So then it helps them to go, oh, okay, all the, the BS tickets are being resolved. And so now I've got to focus on the, the hard ones. And of the hard ones, there's probably a good percentage that we've added some notes or some information to as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's how we're solving it today. So to be uh, to be very laconic, you, you're doing a uh, triage. You're also doing a work order audit. You're, you're doing a cleanup, basically, when you say that you, you eliminate the duplicates. So then yeah. somebody on site don't, don't have to do it. Uh, that's, Correct. That's tremendous value in everything that you just said. I could tell that as an operator, as a person that operated sites, I operated yeah. sites that are 800 plus units. Uh, I, yeah. could use, I could use me some happy <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, it, it's, yeah it, it's been a really um, solid product. Um, the, the, there are challenges with rolling it out. And a lot of the challenges come from status quo right so you know like oh uh, the technicians on site are not um it's it's a it's a change management issue <laughs> so so you know the, the really successful teams we actually tell them don't touch don't treat don't assign work orders when you come in the morning assign it at 11 a.m and, and and some you know if uh you know how properties are so not everyone hears that message right sometimes it, it doesn't go down to the right sites but the sites that come in and touch work orders at 11 a.m they see like a 30 percent reduction in, in just number of tickets overnight um because our team is going in and doing all that work but if you don't then you're like oh there's the same number and they assign it to their guys who then have once they assign it we can't touch it until it's unassigned all right so so yeah so there's some like nuances and um, you know, we're still trying to figure out that piece. How do we get better at the communication? How do we get better at the holding a ticket so that we can't release it until... <laughs> yeah, so there's a few more things that went. 
So next, uh, Jindo, I do mm -hmm. want to talk to you about the prop tech landscape in general in multifamily. Yeah. And this is what I'm what I've been observing, right? Yeah. When when a a, a property starts, uh, uh, when a company starts, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what they hire is two two kinds of people. The first one is the one that you know knows how to design the app, how to write the code. Yeah. And they hire salespeople to go sell. Yeah. They're going to the top of the organization and they make the sell. And what I'm seeing right here, there's an empty area between this, mm -hmm. and there's a missing piece is the end user. Yeah. We're not finding in the end user. I've told to people that have designed apps and they don't have sometimes a basic understanding or how things work on site. Yeah. They, they don't understand like how the process works in real life. Like what does the person do first and second and third? So that's mm. general observation, right? Uh, and this, again, I, I never use your product, but yeah. I've seen it over and over again, it's kind of like a reoccurring thing. So that's yeah. the first challenge. Uh, do you think that there's value in companies like yours involving the end user by taking like hiring people or maybe having people consult for them to 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 help them give them the real life experience not just what it's been imagined in a you know in a computer lab yeah 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 um yeah i i personally think it's like really important to uh so of our team i think we have about 20 or 30 people in our, so our, our company is about 200 people in the organization. Uh, about 33 people uh, have property management experience. Um, and, and I think that's, that's one, that's one very important piece is then you understand the, the user a little bit more. The other important piece is like actually going on site and following, like doesn't actually, doesn't have to be on site, follow your user. So if your user sitting in an office, getting, you know, the reporting, sit down with that person, talk to them. If that person is in the field, like fixing the plumbing, talk to them. If it's a property manager who's doing budgeting, talk to that person. And I think, I think it's really important. And I don't know why why we skip that. Um, I, like, because if you think about software programmers and, and people that build the, the coding for it, um, it's very easy to build software for like myself. Right, so if I'm if like a Facebook, it's easier because I'm like, what do I want as a? <laughs> I want to like photos, okay, or Instagram. I want to take photos or um, Netflix. I just want to watch movies, but it's really hard to build workflow software and do it really, really well. A lot of the, I'll say the old school prop tech uh, technology, they actually sell to two by two users. They sell to the owners, so the uh, people that are like sitting in the you know the, the corporate uh box and just getting schmooze and then uh here, here are some nice dashboards and or some metrics to hold your team accountable and i think that's great i think that's that's one persona the other persona they sell to previously is the accountant or the the cfo right because here's a finance here's an accounting piece a finance piece uh it, it will never go wrong and i think everyone else who cares about them you really made the decision to buy um, but I think it's, to your point, it's very important to sit with the end user, and this actually the end users because data actually flows from one person to another. Like no one's telling the maintenance guy to do inspections for the sake of inspections. It's to do something else. It's to give it to the you know, that report has to go to the resident. Why? Because the resident needs to know what's damaged, what's not damaged, and after that, the the property manager has to bill for it. So what do I bill? What do I not bill? Charge back. Um, then that information goes on back to the, the 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 turn crew or the maintenance guy who has to go fix the property, and so I think really following following the users across from beginning to end, and just that that's how you can build good software. But it's I can tell you, in theory is very easy, but practice is really hard, right? Because uh, the our end users are not technologists, so they can't tell you, oh yeah, you need to build the SQL query. <laughs> they don't know that. They just go. I just want to give someone this report. And so you have to figure out what does that mean? And, and so I think there's a lot of uh, the best product teams spend a lot of time understanding the customer. Yeah. One other uh, area of opportunity for, for prop tech in general and for technology in general that I'm seeing in a space, in our space is yeah. uh, the way rollouts are being conducted. So mm -hmm. You walk me through a typical rollout on, let's say, you have a ten thousand unit portfolio that you're onboarding. 
you have yeah. a 10,000 unit client, could you walk me through the low, rollout? Like, you know, some yeah. ma major, but not every single step, but like. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it, it's, I think like the number one thing that we, we probably see about rollout, successful rollout is buy-in. Like buy-in from, you want to have an executive level sponsor um, because someone has to like crack the whip, right? Someone has to say, this needs to get done or we're doing this. Um, but then you also need to have like an admin. So it's someone that is the person that actually is the person implementing this thing. <laughs> someone needs to be buying it. And typically the exec person gets the admin person to buy in. So that's relatively easy. Then you almost need to have, uh, if for our products are very much on-site users, whether the maintenance guy, regional maintenance, on-site maintenance. So you almost want to have like people that are end, the end user having buy-in as well. And I think if you have like those three or four people, um, then they become champions of your product ac across their organization because there's going to be people that say, I don't know, ugh, why why are we doing this thing? Oh, I like how we used to do it. So someone has to, and, and, and if I tell them as a vendor, they'll be like, yeah, you're, you're selling me a used car. <laughs> you know, like, of course I don't want to buy it. But if someone is on site, their own, their own friend, their peer saying, you know, hey, Adrian, this is going to be so much better. I actually, I'm like you, man. I'm, I I work on site and I know this has improved my life. So that, I think that's, that's the number one, number one thing. Um, the, the other thing I think is really important is user interface. And this is a very, again, you, probably not many people expect it. Um, but the simpler the, the user interface is to understand, the better it is for the customer and the, and the rollout. Um, you know, the, well, uh, there's a there's a saying that the uh, a user interface is like a a great joke. If you have to explain your joke, it's not great anymore. <laughs> so so yeah, you know, UI has to be super simple to use. Um, so I think that's that's the other piece. And once you have those two elements, then you have to have people on our team, our customer success. We have these groups called customer success and implementations. We we try to bring in a lot of industry people to to work in those areas in our business. Um, because they can speak the lingo, um, you know, like understand like the, from the customer, what is what are they trying to achieve? Oh, we're trying to drive our renovation costs lower or we're trying to have adoption. Um, so having having that person be a champion on the happy code side for the customer is very important for, for the rollout as well. Um, and then I think the, the other piece is having dashboards and, and data that's very easily visible so that the, the client and happy code are on the same page. So a common question is like, how many people are using, what percentage of people are using the, the app or the software? And, you know, so having that percentage up. And the next question is, who is not using the software? So being able to show them, hey, these are the people that are using it. These persons are, these people are not using it. So I think if you have those, um, I find that is a typically a very successful rollout um, for, yeah, for what we see. So going back to uh, a large, like 10,000 unit portfolio, do you find it yeah. more beneficial to maybe start with a couple of communities or five, a handful, and mm -hmm. roll those in? Or would you rather roll everybody in at once? I, I would prefer to roll everyone in at once, but um, we, we typically, we, we kind of leave it up to the, the customer. Like we, we suggest, we actually suggest maybe doing like um, a sample of properties. So we, we, we want to do some of the best properties you have and some of the worst ones. And the reason, because we don't want to just go, oh, give me your best technology people. Um, because what happens is the best technology people is not representative of everyone in the organization. We, we actually want dissenters. We want people that say, I hate technology. I'll never use this. This is this is the worst thing. And so our job is to convert those to becoming, oh, this is the best thing. Um, so we try to do on like a, you know, call like five to 10 unit pilot or test or whatever it is. And then once we're successful, then we do probably do like a region by region, portfolio by portfolio. Um, in, in, in quite a lot of cases, we actually, from there, we just do a full rollout across the organization. Uh, how large, remind me, how large was your first, uh, your very first multi, what was- uh, Oh man. Equity. Uh, equity equity mm -hmm. they, It was like 130,000? They had 110,000 uh, at the time. Yeah, 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 so. And remind me, how many, how many units you have now? We have about three and a half million units right okay. now. Yeah. So one thirty, uh, three point something. So that's about thirty times. Okay. So yeah. my next question to you is: Tell me about scaling. Tell me the stories and 
how you know tell me about some challenges that you have you know scaling growing and how did you overcome them because i think this is yeah. just the great lessons to be learned right not just yeah. in the space but in general in scaling a business and, and i would love to hear your story yeah scaling is really hard um and something i've learned is uh scaling is not like this I, scaling is kind of step functions <laughs> like you, you 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 kind of scale and it's pretty good and then you hit this point where you're like everything that you've built breaks then you have to rebuild everything in the organization again um, just how you communicate the systems you use uh you know like initially when you first start you don't have to write anything down everyone is in the room you communicate hey let's do this it's great then you get bigger and you're like okay not everyone's in the room what do we do then you get bigger again you have like okay not everyone's in the room and now I can't tell that person what to do. I have to tell his boss to tell him what to do. And you get another stage bigger. You're like, now I'm going to tell his boss, tell his boss, to tell his boss what to do. And, and I think it's a really big challenge. Um, the, the, one, the one thing that I think that, that's a constant in, in every scale that we've done is like pe there's always people challenges. I think people are the hardest part to, to get right. Um, and then... Yeah, I think that, yeah, they're definitely the people. I, I, I always feel like it's a really hard journey because, um, you know, how you treat them and and you, you have, you know, there's this saying, um, which really sucks, which is, you know, you, you, you hire slow, you fire fast, right? And, 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 and what it really is trying to say is you want to give people the benefit of, the, I, I always try to give people benefit of the doubt and let them grow. But sometimes the, the best thing to do is you, you know, that person may not be thriving in your business. So, having a tough conversation and saying, Hey, we've spoken about this a few times. I just don't see you doing your, your best work at the company better for you to, you know, find something else. And some, a lot of times that person goes to another organization and does, does really well. There are cases where that person is just, you cannot fix some people <laughs> and they have a lot of their own challenges that they're facing. But like, for the most part, I think um, that's one of the key things to, to, to growing is having um, tough conversations and really thinking about like, what are we trying to achieve? Um, but it's really hard because a lot of times the emotions and the personal relationships get in the way um, uh, of having tough conversations, you know? So, yeah. So I think that's probably one of the, the biggest lessons is people challenges. Um, and, and the flip side of that is if you have a great, you know, we've had people in the company been with us since 2012, like basically the beginning, they're still with the company. And, you know, for those people, they continue to grow with the organization. Um, the best thing about them is just the, the, the loyalty, you know, like they're just, you can trust these people. Right. And so, um, I don't know. So there's good and bad, you know, like, but at the end of the day, it's a people problem that we're off trying to face when we scale. Mm -hmm. Jindo. Yeah. What, what advice would you have for a young entrepreneur? They could be old too, not just young, but <laughs> a new, new entrepreneur. <laughs> a new entrepreneur. Let's just call them new, right? A age is not necessary factor. It's not a factor at all, in fact. Yeah. So what advice would you give a you know new entrepreneur that wants to enter the prop tech stage and to build particularly prop tech product for multifamily specifically? What are some pieces of advice, specific pieces of advice that you would have for them? Yeah. Um, oh, that's a, it's a hard one because I'm I'm I've been in the industry for too long and I'm so jaded by <laughs> so many things. Um, you know, like there's like a few like more generic ones. I get more specific. So a generic one would be like, you know, whatever you do, try to again find what you want to do and and go go in there with the the long term, like play the long game. Don't, don't go in to make a quick buck. Because this industry is filled with like short term, you know, operators that come in, run it for a bunch of years, and go sell to one of the large uh, existing people in the market, right? And then the the large folks shut it down. They stop putting R and D money in, and then the poor customers are like, "We spent all this time trusting you, <laughs> giving you business so that you can grow, help us be better, and then you you basically like take it away, and now we have to go find something else." So, I think like trying to understand like the, it's the long game. Um, when you think about like just building, you know, spend a lot of time with your customers and initially like don't try to please everyone, just please the one or two or three customers that, that you work, like potential customers really, really well. 
once you please one or two or three, you can copy and paste that to please the next four, five, six. And once you please the next four, five, six, you can do the next 10 to 20. And, and, and really that was what we did. We, we just did such a great job for equity residential. We rolled out across 100 and, uh, 110,000 units in 45 days. Like that was like, you know, and they were so happy by it. We learned a lot through that. And then the next customer was like a little bit, you know, same. The next customer was easier and easier. And then soon uh, this industry, if you play the long game, this industry, everyone moves around and they're all going to stay within the industry. So the amount of times we have, um, yeah, customers that move from one, you know, one company to another and they're like, oh, I remember I was using you at this company and it was amazing. We have a lot of that. That's, that's how we've basically grown, grown our company. Um, and then the last thing I'll maybe point out to that is like, and this maybe is that blue collar thing. Like, you know, don't, don't discount the, don't discount the the person at the bottom, right? Like don't, don't always, you know, I think we always, like, oh, we, you know, I, I, I've had salespeople that work for us. They're not no longer working for us. They will talk to someone. And as soon as they're like, oh, I'm not a VP. I'm like a lowly, whatever. They dismiss them. And I'm like, that's really rude. A, a, I always think maybe that's my dad. You know what I mean? I feel bad. It's my dad. But like a lot of these people um, move through the ranks, right? They, they, they start off on site. They go become property manager, ask them, become like a regional. The regional becomes like a VP. VP becomes like SVP. And one day they become a CEO. So I think it's a, if you're playing the long game, don't discount these, these relationships because you just, um, you never know yeah, who you're going to meet or who, who can become what. Like, People discounted me when I, when I started. <laughs> they still do. No, but you know, like I, I, when people see me, they don't think I, I run this company, and and that's fine. But try not to do that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I started as a groundskeeper, and you know, one of oh. my the job before I had last before leaving the operations side was vice president of maintenance. So imagine if you know if someone would have like you know mistreated yeah. me, yeah, along the way when I was you know the, at, at the beginning. You know, maybe that wasn't, you know, the, the best thing for them to do. Yeah. You know? So, look, this comes to mind. How how did you land the 130,000 unit deal? What what was, what, what made them, what, what made, made you close? Like, what made you close this deal? Like, what was the closing thing? What was the selling? How did you sell we, them on this? Yeah, we, you know, like, uh, man, it's such a, it's a long time ago. So I don't, um. You know what, what? I don't think we really needed to do too much. Uh, and again, it was that same thing. We were selling to single family. We had um, one of our customers was a larger single family manager. I think they previously, they had some dealings with with the guys at Equity. And then so they basically was like, hey, I've seen your, your product work in this space. I wanted to work on our space. And um and I think the you know when we, when we showed them the demo, we demoed them the app looked really easy to use. Um, it solved exactly what they wanted, nothing more, nothing less. Um, we were flexible and like, oh yeah, you wanted to integrate with your your PMS system, yeah, we can do that. You know, like let's do that. Um, and I think like during the contract negotiations, we were we had to be super flexible because it's B two R. So. Um, I think we would, I think that at the end of the day, we just did a great job at just executing and doing that one thing very, very well. Um, I don't, yeah, there wasn't like a secret sauce on, on like, oh, you no, know, we, we did this special thing. I think we just built, built a really good product that solved the problem. We could explain the problem really well. They, they came and told us what the, what they thought was the um, ROI. And this is another thing I learned, right? So people always say like, oh, uh, what, what's the benefit of your software? Oh, we drive NOI. And it's like, okay, when you tell people what you do, no one believes you. <laughs> because if uh, now I actually own multifamily units. And if if I listen to every single vendor that said that their product will move my NOI, I'll be a multi-billionaire. <laughs> but I'm still seeing the same results. So I think we just did our thing really well. People liked it. Um, the, the guy was very easy to roll out. Um, we didn't BS them if we didn't have something if we said we didn't have it and I think that's how we closed that deal you, you grew this company to be amazing over 3 million you know end users I mean, I mean 3 million uh, you, you, units I'm sorry yes yeah. what helps you keep an edge there's there's a there's a lot of competition in, in a field there's a lot coming from behind a lot yeah. of funding, a lot of everything 
and technology in itself changes every day. So what sure. helps you keep keep on edge or over the competition, staying relevant? Yeah, um, I think like you know having a bit of paranoia all the time. Like I'm very worried about like I'm worried about the big companies. I'm worried about the 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 head to head competitors. I'm worried about the new competitors that are coming out with AI and all these things. I think so that that I'm always worried about that. But I always. I, for me, I, I I really want to make the industry a better place. I really want to improve multifamily. I want to help, you know, like the the off, the, the on-site user who's making twenty bucks an hour. I want to make his life better. I want to make the his boss's life better. So I I really just want to just improve the industry. We've had many offers from uh, competitors to buy the company, and we've always said no. Right, and so for me, I'm like, it's it's not about to me. It's not about the money. Um, because if it was, then I, I would have sold this company many, many times already. Uh, to me, I'm like, what if, what if we could just build something that changes the way people work and live? Um, and that to me, like, that's that's the exciting part. And then so then I ask myself, how do you change how they work and live? And then, then you go, okay, these are the things that they need. And you listen, to, I, I go around the country eating lots of dinners, listening to people's problems, and hopefully we can solve them as they come up. So that that, that keeps me on edge. On the edge. <laughs> you know, amazing conversation. I thank you very much for being a good sport and being here and answering all the questions. Um, in closing, I'd like for you to, you know, say something that you wish you would have said you didn't have the opportunity to say or to maybe answer a question you wish I would have asked and I didn't. Yeah, so maybe my only, I guess, more of a sales pitch is, um, you know, if, if, if your listeners are out there and, um, you know, trying to solve problems, like, you know, think of us, think of Happy Co as a long-term partner to help solve these bigger problems that you have. Um, but the, as long as I'm a part of the company, we're not looking to sell the company. We're not looking to, uh, you, you know, like, we're, we're just wanting to help solve more problems. So think of us as a long-term partner. Um, and if you have problems that you're facing and you think there's a way to make it better, let me know. And, you know, we'd love a discussion to figure out, okay, maybe something we can build or help to improve. Jindo, if someone, one of our uh, listeners or followers wants to get in touch with you, what are some ways to connect with you? Yeah, so if you go to uh, tinder.com slash Jindo, I'm just kidding. No, if you go to, uh, uh, if, you, if, if, if you can find me on LinkedIn, J-I-N-D-O-U-L-E-E. -E. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm the only Jindo Lee, I think. Um you can find me on 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 our on email j i n d o u at happy dot so I'm, I'm I'm always around. <laughs> Jindo was a real pleasure to have you today. Amazing, very engaging conversation. Thank you for taking the time, yeah. taking an hour no. out of your busy day on a Friday afternoon uh, <laughs> to to be here with uh, me and for the audience. Uh, I hope to maybe get you here back soon to do a second episode. I haven't even uh, scratched the surface with I, the yeah. questions that I wanted to ask. I know there's, so, there's a lot of stuff to work on. And thank, thank you again for doing this, Adrian. It was a pleasure. Everybody, thank you very much for watching us. Uh, I'm your host, Adrian Danila, and this is Multifamily Chronicles. We hope to uh, see you back here soon. Have a great day.